Ethiopia, according to techcentral.co.za, has criminalized Skype. That's right. That wonderful mode of communications on the internet of being able to do teleconferencing, to be able to talk to someone and see their face at the same time on the internet. In Ethiopia, it's now illegal. That's right. Let's all point and laugh at that backwards little African country while we forget how bad we're being oppressed here in the United States for a minute, shall we? Ethiopia's state-owned internet service provider, the Ethiopian Telecommunication Corporation, has begun performing deep packet inspection of all internet traffic in the country. The country's government recently ushered in new legislation that criminalizes the use of services such as Skype, Google Talk, and other forms of internet phone calling. How much you want to bet this has something to do with somebody making money? That's right, using the violence of government to oppress and suppress competition and keep them from being able to compete with phone services that are making a boatload more money by exploiting their people by keeping a superior technology off the market. The new law, which came into effect on May 24, makes use of Internet voice services punishable by hefty fines and up to 15 years in prison. That's amazing. This is amazing. Whoever's really behind this, whatever telecom corporation has decided that we're going to do this, this is, wow, Ethiopia's government. I mean, that's a really effective protection racket. They've convinced the government that if someone just uses their competitor's products, they get locked in a cage for 15 fucking years. The official line from the government is that the move is intended to protect national security. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's in the name of national security. And protect the national state-owned telecoms carrier from losing revenue to Skype and similar services. This despite the fact that Ethiopia's fixed-line penetration rate is the second worst in Africa and after Sierra Leone at an estimated 1% of its 85 million strong population. Well, I guess it's not such a small little country. It's uh, about a quarter of the size of the United States. But they're open about this. This is the fucked up part. We don't want to keep the state-owned telecoms from losing revenue to Skype. Oh, that's right. The telecom industry here that we're talking about is part of the government itself. It's already an industry that the government has taken over. Now it makes perfect sense. Ethiopia has instituted numerous restrictions on its digital community in recent years. The government has previously closed down internet cafes for offering voice over internet protocol services and in December 2006 made it obligatory for internet cafes to keep records of the names and addresses of their customers in an effort to clamp down on bloggers and other users critical of the regime. Oh, so it has that added bonus for the government too. But I love to see how this is stifling technological development because eventually the idea of having a phone service separate from the internet might even seem silly entirely but this is like the government saying well no we run the horse and buggy industry here so anybody who has a car who would have a car that would be bad for the the, the horse and buggy industry so we're going to put you in a cage if you actually use a car and the result is technological stifling and as you can see well our good reason for them to have the second worst fixed line penetration rate in Africa. The new law prohibits all voice over IP traffic along with audio and video data traffic via social media. The Africa Review reports that the law also gives the government the right to inspect any imports of voice communication equipment and accessories. Ah, you see that? Now they have another excuse to snoop. The OpenNet initiative, which tracks internet filtering and surveillance, says in a report on Ethiopia that the country already blocks all blogs hosted at blogspot.com and at nazareth.com, a site that aggregates Ethiopian news and has space for blogs and forums. The new legislation is no doubt also motivated by the, motivated by the events of the Arab Spring that saw mass protests organized via social media, with many bloggers critical of Ethiopia's current government. Censorship by the state looks likely to increase. And you know what? They can't stop this. They can't stop this. This is, they're asking for it. See, the government protection racket, if anything, if they want to maintain their control in Ethiopia, should slowly be loosening reforms just enough, loosening the restrictions on technology just enough to keep people from revolting. And they're going in the opposite direction. I mean, they could have maybe taken over some of the internet and, you know, 
co created a state monopoly on, on some of this technology, but provided more for their people. But no, no. And this is the thing. The Internet cannot be stopped, cannot be stifled. And it doesn't matter that they blocked this website or that website. They've got email. And if you've got email, if you've got that expectation of zero-cost communications, well, the truth will get out. And sooner or later, people in Ethiopia are going to realize what their government is doing and how badly they are hurting and keeping their country back. And it could be that we see the next domino to fall in the Arab Spring will be Ethiopia, and we'll see a similarly styled revolution there as a reaction to bullshit from their government like this. But when's America going to get to that point? Or is our government protection racket too clever for the American people? Only time will tell, but as much as the rest of the world may be angry at the U.S. for its interventionism, they also have plenty to laugh at about us poor American serfs. And in China, well, like I said, it could be worse than the rest of the world. This from AFP, China confirms forced abortion case after uproar. uproar. China confirms forced abortion case after uproar. This from AFP, a woman cycles past a billboard encouraging couples to have only one child in a suburb while Chinese authorities confirmed that a woman was forced to abort seven months into her pregnancy several days after her plight came to light when images of her baby's corpse were posted online. Thank God for the interwebs. Rights groups have blamed authorities in North China's Shangxi province for forcing Fang Jianmei to abort her pregnancy because she failed to pay a hefty fine for exceeding China's strict one-child population control policy. The Shangxi provincial government said in a statement that a preliminary probe had confirmed the case was basically true and the investigators have recommended action be taken against the perpetrators. As the provincial government said on its website, this is a serious violation of the nat National Population and Family Planning Commission's policies, jeopardizes the population control work, and has caused uneasiness in society. The woman having an extra child or forcing her to abort it, is that... Hmm, the real threat to the ease of society? Yeah, I would think that's more of a threat. People seeing a forced abortion might make them actually question the one-child policies. But if we could just realize, or the people of China would just realize, that having people pay a fine for having a second child is just as wrong, I don't think this policy would have ever been instituted in the first place. The government did not pinpoint exactly who the perpetrators, perpetrators were, but vowed to avoid a repeat of such a case in which it was against regulations in effect since 2001, banning late-term abortions. Chinese web users have reacted in anger to the abortion, with one comparing it to acts perpetrated by Japanese devils and Nazis after photos online showed Fang lying in a hospital bed next to the blood-smeared body of her baby. A relative told AFP on Wednesday that Fang and her husband had opposed the termination. An official at the National Family Planning Commission who declined to be named said earlier that the commission viewed the matter as serious and important and that the probe was being handled at the top level. China has implemented its draconian family planning policy since the late 1970s in an effort to control a population that has grown to 1.3 billion, the world's largest. But who cares if it's the world's largest within an arbitrary government border? What matters is really how dense it is and control of population density is really screwed up by government incentives when they create unnatural concentrations of wealth and power. I mean, look at New York. If it wasn't for the New York Fed and all the money on Wall Street, New York wouldn't nearly be as densely populated as it is. And if it wasn't for government intervention in the economy in the first place, the incentive to live in urban areas as opposed to rural areas wouldn't be the same as it is. And we wouldn't have this kind of dense population. We're not running out of land here in this world, not yet. And when we get to that point, it's the market that will provide the incentives for us to regulate our populations. And in a way, it already is. Technology also empowering people to better control the way that they reproduce. But the idea that you can control an entire nation's population with a one-child policy and not end up with disgusting incidents like this is kind of naive. Under the policy, urban families are generally allowed to have one child, while rural families can give birth to two children if... 
if the first is a girl. They have to pay a fine if they contravene the rules. Rights groups say that as a result of the policy, thousands of women have been forced by authorities to terminate their pregnancies. And even if you're not deliberately, directly forced to have an abortion, if it's if you have this child, we're going to steal a shit ton of money from you, that's kind of like forcing you to have an abortion. Blind activist Chen Guangcheng, who recently left China for the United States after fleeing house arrest, was once jailed after angering local officials for bringing to light hundreds of forced abortions. Official statistics show that since the start of the policy, the number of abortions peaked in 1983 with a total of 14.37 terminations that year. The U.S. said on Monday it has expressed opposition to China's one-child policy act after activists reported that a five-month pregnant woman faces an imminent forced abortion in a separate case. We make no secret. This is from State Department spokeswoman Victoria Newland. We make no secret that the United States strongly opposes all aspects of China's coercive birth limitation policies, including forced abortion and sterilization, and we always raise these issues with the Chinese government. But we never raise the issues of coercion itself because that would ruin the American government scam. And in Egypt, this is an important story today, from aljazeera.com, Egypt decree grants arrest powers to military. Egypt's justice ministry has issued a decree allowing military police and intelligence officers to arrest civilians suspected of crimes, restoring some of the powers of the decades-old emergency law, which expired just two weeks ago. This is the problem with having a revolution and not an evolution, as opposed to a lovelution in Egypt. They successfully overthrew the government, but forgot to shift the paradigm. And it may have shifted, so don't get me wrong. A significant paradigm shift in Egypt in terms of the attitude towards government definitely occurred, but it didn't quite get completed in a way that allowed itself to be manifest in the governance of Egypt, at least not just yet, and they're still reeling with the consequences of that. So we're going to see a lot more turmoil out of there. The decree applies to a range of offensive offenses, including those deemed harmful to the government, destruction of property, obstructing traffic, and resisting orders. So they're basically fully back to a military police state in Egypt. Best of luck to you there in Cairo in continuing to overthrow the powers that be, but you've clearly got a lot of work to do still. <sighs> wow, so many more stories, so much to get to today, and we didn't, we didn't, we're, we're not even scratching the surface, so I just, oh, we've got a, a few minutes left, we'll come to a few uh, local stories, or excuse me, American stories here. Dozens of student phones snagged in robbery. This from MyFoxNewYork.com. Armed robbers stole between 25 and 50 phones that belonged to Bronx High School students. They were being held in a truck parked near Christopher Columbus High School on Astore Avenue. And the scary thing is here, not that 50 students had their cell phones stolen. I mean, thefts in New York happen all the time. But that it was the government that directly made this possible through their policies. Because in New York, because of their school rules, you're not allowed to have a phone in the school. So students who want to be able to connect with their parents who find that it's essential to do this, and now parents are fighting for their students' rights to have phones in school in case of emergencies, Students have to go to school and leave their phones in trucks outside the school. They're supposed to be locked and kept safe. And they have to pay for this. So they pay an extra service, and they've created this whole new industry of watching students' cell phones. And so there were these two men going in, in this truck called Safe Mobile Storage. Three men walked up to them, bound them with duct tape, and stole the phones in the truck. According to Peter Vallone Jr., city council member, theft is this theft is the result of wrong-headed Department of Education policy which endangers our kids. It's bad enough that our school children are forced to haggle with truck drivers and bodega owners because the DOE can't figure out a way to allow phones to be brought into school. But now this incompetence has led to an even more dangerous situation. Robberies outside of schools and potential predators with all sorts of personal information. Well, geez, Mr. City Council member, could it possibly be that uh, the incompetence 
has led to an even more dangerous situation in which parents are robbed in order to pay for an education for their children that isn't even worth their while, that exposes them to greater dangers from private personal thieves. Yeah, so now we have a failure of the government protection theft racket, and it is our children, again, that suffer the consequences. And that's all the time we have today for the Adam vs. the Man podcast. Thank you so much for talking or listening and tuning in and downloading and, I don't know, it's been a crazy, crazy day already. Send your hate mail to adam at adamversustheman.com, and we will talk to you tomorrow.